Hey, what's up everybody? We want to welcome you to another episode of the Dreamers Pro Daily Recap, where we give you a recap of all of the hot topics that we covered that day. You can catch them in their long format and also catch it fully streaming for free on Apple Podcasts. You know, heading into the All-Star break, the Clippers had a 31, no, excuse me. Yes, no, they had a 30 and 6 record or something there about. They were the hottest team in the NBA. They were clicking. They were playing. You know, they, they were firing on all cylinders, and they looked very, very scary. Everyone was talking about them. At the time, Kawhi Leonard was being mentioned in the MVP conversation. I never said he should be the MVP. At the time, I said he should be in the conversation. But ever since the All-Star break, the Clippers have not looked good. And I remember after the first two games since the All-Star break, I made a post on the channel. I'm like, these Clippers are not looking good. Some people started getting on me. Oh, bro, just relax. It's only two games. Why are you making a big deal out of it? It's just two games. I'm like, all right. All right, all right. Well, since the All-Star break, the Clippers have played at least 20 games. And in the last 20 games, the Clippers are 10 and 10. They have a 500 record over the last 20 games. Now, help me figure it out. A team that was like 30 and 5 that goes on to then be 20 and 20, I mean, of 10 and 10, you got to believe that there's some serious problems taking place. And that's been the case. The Clippers, you know, funny enough, in some of these games, I actually expect the Clippers to lose. And I'm, or if I'm watching the game, I'll be saying to myself, you know what? I wouldn't be surprised if they lost this game. And that's exactly what happened yesterday. Yesterday, they played against the Philadelphia 76ers, who are on their West Coast swing playing both LA teams without Joel Embiid. Without Joel Embiid. The Clippers, as a matter of fact, I forgot to watch the first half. I tuned into the first half, uh, into the second half, and I saw that they were down. I'm like, this doesn't surprise me. And I'm watching the game, and they're just there going through the motions, not really engaged, really flat-footed. They didn't have a lot of enthusiasm, didn't have a lot of energy. They just seemed to be in a total daze. So I turned off the game at the end of the third quarter, and to no one's surprise, I woke up and saw that the Clippers lost that game. So what happened? During the post-game interview, they were talking to the players and coaches. And in this interview, they were talking to head coach Ty Lue. Now, if you know Ty Lue, from time to time, he can get pissed off and he can really let his emotions uh, you know, fly and tell people exactly what he thinks. So during his post-game interview, he was talking to the media and it got to one point where actually he started swearing. Now, he did it in a joking way, but you could tell it was some of his frustration that was coming out. So what we want to do is want to play exactly what head coach Ty Lue had to say here, and then we're going to come back and continue on the show. Take a listen to what he had to say here. And coach, one more for me. Um, he's used the word bad habits and you guys staying consistent and stuff like that. When you guys aren't playing well and, you, and they're a veteran team, how frustrating does it become for you, or you and your coaching staff to, when guys know what they're supposed to do, but they consistently have errors within the game and they're being taught over and over again. How frustrating is it for a guy like yourself who knows how to coach, know what it takes to get to the highest level to win a championship? Your guys know what it takes. How frustrating is it for you specifically? I mean, yeah, I mean, it's very frustrating. You know, I'm, I'm huge on execution, yeah. you know, on both sides of the basketball. And, you know, we talk about it every day, just, you know, not taking shortcuts and doing it the right way. And so I think they're frustrated as well. I mean, it's, it's embarrassing. You know, when you lose a team like this, I'm not saying they don't have great players over there, but and Nick Nurse is a great coach, but when you come in, you know, minus, you know, Joel Embiid and, you know, Nico sits out tonight, <coughs> Roko's out, Kyle Lowry sits out, um, and you're playing at home, it's like you have to take advantage of those type of things and type of games. And so, um, you know, it is frustrating, you know, showing the same thing over and over and um, not getting the results you want consistently. You know, I would say that consistently getting the same, you know, not getting the results every single game. And so, um, you know, you keep talking about it, but at some point you got to do it, you know. And so um, that's it. That's all I got to say. Last one, Jess. You mentioned at some point you got to do it rather than just talk about it. I'm kind of curious, in the game, when they're not executing the way that you want them to and talking to them over and over and showing them what they're doing wrong isn't, getting through to them as much as you probably like. What other steps can you take to kind of get the message? Or is it as big as sitting a guy down for a minute or two to kind of make sure he sees someone else doing it? Something like that? Um, yes, possibility. Is it something that, I know it's a nuclear option, so to speak, but is it something that you would do in the future to kind of get it well, through? 
I mean, they're grown men, and they understand, like, we're a veteran team. It's not like, you know, we're playing with second- and third-year players. And so I'm never the type of guy that wants to show a player up or show them if they're making a mistake. Um, I, I'd rather not do that because now it's a story for you guys, you know. But, I mean, they understand what the f*** I mean. <laughs> they understand what they're supposed to be doing. And far behind can write all his little, you know, little jokes and little cool, you know what I'm saying? But they understand. Like, and so, you know, we just got to do better. You know, we just got to do better, you know, all around the board. So you heard what he had to say. There are a few things I want to talk about. First of all, I've been noticing various people talking about the absence of Russell Westbrook, who is nursing an injury to his hand. And some people are saying that what the Clippers need right now, or rather what they're missing right now, is the leadership of Russell Westbrook. And if I'm going to be totally honest with you guys, I was totally confounded when I heard people say that. Now, some people say, why? Are you saying Russell Westbrook is not a leader? No. The reason I'm saying that is, but I thought Kawhi Leonard is on the team. I thought he's on the team. About a week or so ago, I posted on the channel, Kawhi Leonard is a great player, but if I was an NBA player, I would not want him to be my leader at all. How can you have a team with Kawhi Leonard, with Paul George and James Harden and talking about, oh, we're, 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 we're missing Russell Westbrook because he was the one that would really lead us. So if Russell Westbrook wasn't on that team, are you telling me that there would be no leadership on the floor? How is that even possible? You have three max guys on the, on, on the floor. And out of those three max guys, you can't find a leader out of not one of them. Listen, I'm a Kobe Bryant fan, and it's and it's moments like this that really make me miss Kobe, man. Because obviously Kobe was a great player, but he was also a leader. Kobe was proactive. He would get in people's faces. He would talk to people, and I just don't see that with the Clippers. Let's get into some of the data here and, and, and some of the stats with, these, with, with the Clippers. First of all, in terms of defensive rating, as we currently stand, the Clippers, their defensive rating is number four, a uh, 14. Let me tell you the teams that they're, that they're ahead of them the Phoenix Suns, who no one has been accusing of being a great defensive team. Of course, you have the Denver Nuggets. You have the Houston Rockets. No surprise there with Emil Odoka. You have the New Orleans Pelicans, the team that they're going most likely to be playing. Then you have the Oklahoma City Thunder. You have the Cleveland Cavaliers, the Boston Celtics, and the Minnesota Timberwolves. Now, what do you notice about, about, about some of those teams? What you notice is some of those teams are in the Western Conference, and those are teams that most likely, if they want to get out of the West, they may have to see. You're looking at the Phoenix Suns. You're looking at the Denver Nuggets. You're looking at the Oklahoma City Thunder. You're looking at the New Orleans Pelicans. You're looking at the Minnesota Timberwolves. These are teams that are in the Western Conference. And yet you find yourself behind all of them from a defensive rating standpoint. If you look at the amount of points that the Clippers give up, although they score 116 points per game, 16.5, Clippers give up 112.7. Just about a three-point differential. So on certain nights, if shots are not going down or whatever is not happening, they're going to lose those games. This is very concerning, and I'm sure Steve Ballmer is somewhere punching the air. Listen, I've come to the conclusion that I'm not going to come to a conclusion on this team until they get to the playoffs. That's where I'm really going to reserve my judgment and to really get a good understanding. But as now, as we speak, I have zero confidence in this team and they don't deserve anyone's confidence. Not, not, not that they need it. But if I was a betting man, I would not be betting on the Clippers right now. Well, yesterday, uh, the Lakers had a big win. I want to pull it up here. While that's um, while I'm getting that, let me get the NBA standings. Yeah, so the Lakers had a pretty big win against the Indiana Pacers, right? They beat them 150 uh, to 145. I didn't watch the game because I was so tired yesterday uh, and I went to bed. So I woke up this morning, was kind of combing through the internet, and I came across an article that was basically highlighting um, something that Indiana Pacers head coach Rick Carlisle had to say about the Lakers. And the article from Fade Away says, Rick Carlisle throws shade at referees for massive free throw differential against the Lakers. And I'm like, wait a minute. Haven't we already been here before? Wasn't it not too long ago we had the Toronto Raptors head coach complaining about this very same thing? And I'm like, okay, here we go again. 
So I decided to kind of go through the article and to basically see what Rick Carla had to say. Uh, and as it turns out, there's an actual audio. So I clicked on the audio and it was actually at the beginning of his press conference. As soon as he sat down to take interview, uh, take questions, it was the first thing that came out of his mouth. So what we want to do is want to quickly play what Rick Carla had to say is only about a 50 second clip and then want to come back and continue on the show. Take a listen to what he had to say here. I thought our guys really battled in this game. Um, there were just certain things that were impossible to overcome. Um, a 27 free throw differential is one and a 17 foul differential is the other. And I'll leave it at that. All right. Uh, well, I'll, I want to start with this Pascal. We've talked a lot about this. He was great. Yeah. Yep. He's great. You know, any time we were struggling to create shots, he, he was he was great. He, he created something. He got to the paint, kicked it out, got it in the basket, got an in one. So he was he was tremendous. What uh, I think um, I want to ask about Aaron, because he obviously took that shot from from Reddish. It seemed like he was stripped up on that for a while. Did he come out of that OK physically? And obviously it seemed like he, he put some, you know, a pretty solid physical job defending. Him. I'm concerned. What's that? What's that? I'm concerned, but we won't know till, till tomorrow. So you heard what Rick Carlisle had to say uh, here. So let me just go into the box score because I, I didn't actually look at that myself. So I'm looking at the box score here. And let me see. So the Indiana Pacers attempted um, 16 free throws to the Lakers, 43. Now, let me see. So Spencer did when he got nine. Austin Reeves got 12. Anthony Davis got five. LeBron got eight. Whereas the Indiana Pacers got, Pascal got two, Aaron Naismith got two, Miles Turner got four, and that was about it, and it sprinkled out. That's a very, very big uh, discrepancy. Now, some people will look at that and say, well, the Lakers were more aggressive, obviously, you're attacking the basket and all of that. So let me look at the fouls, because if the Lakers are that aggressive, let me see what the fouls were. Um, no turnovers, personal fouls. So the Lakers finished the game with 14 personal fouls and the Indiana Pacers finished the game with 31 personal fouls. So I didn't see this game, but based on what the personal fouls is saying, it is saying that obviously the Pacers were fouling a lot, but I didn't see the game. I'd have to watch it to see exactly whether or not some of those things were fouls. Now to listen to head coach, uh, Rick Carlisle essentially say that we cannot overcome uh, the refs. That's definitely not a good look. The NBA has been having a tough time with its refereeing uh, situation. As you guys know, they recently just fined uh, Rudy Gobert $100,000 for suggesting that the refs were paid off. This is definitely something that the NBA wants to get under control. Again, I, I didn't see the game, uh, so I don't know. All I can go off of is the highlights and you know what was said there. Um, and they're going to be two schools of thought here. From the Lakers standpoint and Lakers fan standpoint, they're going to be like, it's the game, man. What do you want? Like, they'll say if they foul less, right? Uh, if it's the opponents or maybe other people that are not fans of the Lakers, they're going to say, but the Lakers have always had this. You've always had these questions about the Lakers going all the way back to Kobe and Shaq's uh, uh, Lakers versus the Sacramento Kings. There's always these, these, these stories happen about them. But to me... Um, I don't really think that there's anything that I don't think there's a way that you can deal with this right now. Will the NBA fine Rick Carlisle? Uh, probably. I don't know, but they probably will. Um, but I didn't see the game. All I know is that this seems to be uh, the reputation that the Lakers have. Uh, you hear a lot of people say the Lakers always get always get preferential treatment. They always get preferential treatment. From a business standpoint, obviously, the NBA wants the Lakers in the playoffs because uh, they're a big team. They're, they're a moneymaker. I think if they could have it their way, uh, they would have the Lakers and they would have the Golden State Warriors make it into the playoffs. But, you know, these guys want to make their money. And I can't be upset with them. They want to make their money in terms of other teams uh, and other people complaining about it. I don't really see how uh, that's going to change anything, to be quite honest with you. I think that there's certain things that you can talk, you can protest, and you'll see change. And there's certain things that you can complain about, you can do shows about, 
and nothing still will happen. And I think this is just one of those cases, man. I, I, I think that, you know, I remember a series that Kobe was playing in in 2009, 2010 against um, the Denver Nuggets. And he was playing against, not Delonte West, I can't, um, da Dante, I think it's Dante West, I can't remember his name. And all throughout that series, you could tell that they were trying to basically injure Kobe. If you go back and look at that series, you see Kobe just shooting jump shots. He would constantly walk under him. There's a play where Kobe, um, what is it, Tr tried to like, he was running to the basket to, to, to dunk, and he slightly pushed him on the back. And as I was watching that series, I was saying to myself, but this dude is trying to injure you. And I'm like, why isn't Kobe reacting? Why isn't he saying anything to the refs? Kobe, what he did was he played through it. It was really weird because I'm like any other person be like, yo, look what he's doing. Look what he's doing. And Kobe was just like, I think Kobe accepted the situation for what it was going to be. And if the refs weren't going to, you know, come in and change something, he was like, then so be it. I'll play through it. And that's what he did. And I think in certain some of these cases, people may feel a type of way, but you got to play through it. Is it fair? No, life is unfair. Trust me. But uh, again, I didn't see the game, so I don't know. Um, LeBron James and JJ Redick debuted their podcast uh, last week, right? And it came with a lot of hype and hoopla. And it created a lot of conversation, justifiably, because when you have a name uh, like LeBron James, who's the, the current face of the NBA, and you're pairing with a guy like J.J. Redick, who's always on TV, had his own podcast, um, you expect there to be a lot of uh, attention and people looking forward to you know, watching it. And that's exactly what happened. The debut show, which is about 43 minutes or thereabout, got about 1.8 or maybe 2 million. I could be wrong now. Maybe 2 million views that first episode, and they picked up. Um, a ton of subscribers and there's been a lot of conversations some people like the podcast some people don't but they've made it clear that listen this is going to be a basketball thing uh, we want to focus on basketball JJ Redick has gone on ESPN on numerous occasions and lamented the coverage of sports and talks about he's basically complained about the fact that it's all about headlines whenever I say something that will grab a headline or there's some controversy people tune in but whenever I talk about the X's and O's of basketball, people don't really click to see those uh, those type of shows. So it seems like LeBron James and and um, J.J. Redick wanted to provide something new to the market that they thought uh, it was missing. So this morning I was doing some research and I came across an article here that basically is explaining um, or basically where you have LeBron James explaining why he and J.J. Redick actually decided to start the podcast and you're going to hear from lebron james himself so let me get into it here it says lebron james and, and uh, jj reddick mind the game podcast was started to re-educate fans of basketball um with what the true essence of the game is according to lebron himself i feel like we're losing the essence of the game of basketball and the true meaning behind the game teaching our youth and teaching people what the game of basketball truly means i was getting very frustrated with the daily comparisons every single day who's better between you and david metamin or how this would affect your legacy if these guys played in the 50s or if this guy played in the 50s today, it's not good for the youth. The article then continues on. James also, James also revealed why he thinks the conversation needs to change and why he started the podcast with J.J. Reddick. If you're hearing this uh, every day on national television, I feel like our audience needed a different approach to the true essence of the game, how I fell in love with the game. When you have someone like J.J., who has a mindset about the game of basketball is very smart and fell in love with the game for the uh, for all the right reasons it's something i've been thinking about for a while with jj it was a uh, perfect um timing and then uh the article then went on to say a few other things there and of course is the audio of lebron actually uh expressing those views that we just read out to you just now so what are my thoughts on this first of all from a from a strategic standpoint, um, I think it's smart. If you read the book, Blue Ocean uh, Strategy, you basically want to go somewhere and serve a market that's being underserved. So even though there's a lot of conversation in the basketball space, there are a lot of podcasts, there's a new podcast popping up, what seems like every single 
day or whatever every single week there's a new podcast there's a new player there's a new independent creator talking about sports um it's always interesting to try to come at this thing from a different angle and in this case lebron is like listen we want to get into the x's and o's and teach people basketball and i think that that's needed um i watched the first show and they they really got into the you know the nitty-gritty of the sport they got into a lot of the jargon uh that nba players use when they play uh, basketball um some of the audibles and stuff like that uh it's educational and i think that it can serve people that are looking for a deeper understanding of the sport so obviously there are always going to be people that it, that will be interested in that now to jj's point which was the following um when he was on espn essentially complaining about the fact oh when i talk about the x's and o's no one watches but whenever i talk about for instance doc rivers all of a sudden millions and millions of people tune in uh the question is why and i think that the reason that is is it's because it's more interesting for people whether we like it or not for whatever reason uh people tend to have certain behaviors people like drama right people like confrontation people like salacious stories people like to see fights um for whatever reason that garners a lot of attention right so i don't think that this podcast will change that because it's a human behavior uh number one i think there's also the aspect of it um just make sure the meal is cooked really properly i don't need to know exactly how it was made there's also that aspect of it right where people want the finished product and i don't really need to know all of the steps that went into it just get it done if i go if i go to a restaurant i order steak i want it to be good i don't need the, the the chef to come out here and explain to me why the steak is so good some people be interested in that others won't be it's just the way that it's going to be but um i definitely think that what these guys are doing i think there are a lot of people that are going to be interested in that however i will say this though um you will need to sprinkle in um certain shows that address some of the things that are happening in the sport and the culture um because ultimately people are tuning in to hear what you have to say about other things as well and when you have a personality like lebron james his bigger than life personality yes we know you know basketball yes we want to hear about basketball but we also want to know what the lebron think about what just happened that night what well, for instance he did a show about um the comeback that the lakers had against the clippers he spoke about that well that's interesting right apart from the x's and o's so i think there's going to have to be a blend i also think that doing these things you also have to be flexible you don't want to be too um uh, rigid with your opinions you got to be with your with your with your strategy you also have to be flexible and look at what people are looking for um i think that's just with everything right you just can't be too you know oh i'm going to do it like this and this is going to be the only way that's going to be done but this is just my view right to me as someone that covers basketball that talks about basketball it's a very educational show for someone that's taking their kid to the basketball game on a on a friday night or taking their family to go watch a game will they sit down and watch that podcast probably probably not and that's just how it's going to go because different people they're different they're different audience demographics that follow the sport they're younger people they're people in their 20s 30s 40s and people have different things happening in their life so um it also comes down to people's time so these are my thoughts whatever you guys think leave your thoughts and comments in the comment section we we'll catch you on the next show peace